is it fair is it fair to say that your relationship with Luis Santiago was troubled? Yes. Ma'am, you recall seeing States 45 before, do you not? Yes. Ma'am, did you describe either of the attackers as wearing earrings? No, I didn't. So you'd agree that the subject wearing the earrings obviously would not be one of those who attacked you? No, I said I don't remember. Well, you'd agree that the subject with the earrings couldn't be the shooter? No. I said that I couldn't see his ears. Okay. All right. Now, the subject is number five. Uh, would you describe his hair as asymmetrical? The one that's next to the shooter? Next to the individual you've identified as the shooter. What's asymmetrical mean? Is there more hair on one side of his head than the other? It seems to look that way. Okay. Um, you didn't describe either of the individuals having hair like that, did you? No. One of these, you described the subject as having big lips, didn't you? Full lips, I said. Full lips. And at least one of these subjects has got, is biting their lip or pulling their lip down where you can't see it. I don't recall that. Wouldn't you agree that uh, when they presented you those six pictures, you were, were immediately able to rule out at least three of them. I ruled out all of them, I believe, except the shooter. Well, now, you described the, the, the shooter in this, in this case as wearing a red sweatshirt? Yes. Okay. Now, of the, of the six subjects up there, is it not fair to say that five of them are wearing a black or dark colored shirt? It looks that way. Only one subject is wearing a shirt that could conceivably be red. I don't recall that. Well, you'd agree that one subject, subject number four, the shirt he's wearing is lighter, substantially lighter, and therefore different from the other five. It looks lighter. When you say that you're positive in your identification, are you sure that your identification isn't based in part uh, on in his photo and that of the others? No, I've seen his face. All right. But even after you, now, when the police came to your house to, to have you make this identification, you told them that you were not certain. I don't recall that. You told them that you, you thought it was the one. No, I don't recall that. You told them that you were pretty sure it was the one. I don't recall that. And then you recall Detective Smith bringing you the, 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 the photo spread and pointing out where you should sign to say that you were certain of your identification. No, I identified him. You don't recall her being the, the first person to say that, that you were certain of your identification? After I d identified him. Well, ma'am, the first time she asked you to sign where you were certain. You asked to take it back and look at it some more, didn't you? I wanted to make sure. And even after you looked at it the second time, your words were still, I think that's him. I'm pretty sure that's him. No, I said that's him. And in fact, it was the detective who basically showed you the form and told, showed you where to mark that you were certain. Could you repeat the question? It was the detective who showed to you the form twice and showed you where to mark that you were certain before you ever actually used the, that word yourself. No, I was certain. Ma'am, you weren't certain days afterward, were you? No, I was certain. Do you remember a reporter coming up to you and showing you a picture of Marky Elkins on his cell phone? Yes, I do. And then you called the police? No, I told that reporter that they got the right man called Detective Smith and you asked her whether or not you had identified the right person. No, I said to the reporter that they got the right man. And then you called the police officer to make sure that you were correct on March 24th. I don't recall that. And then 
you pump the detective for more information about the case to satisfy yourself that you'd make the right decision. No, I wanted to make sure that he was going to be indicted. And the detective had to tell you that she couldn't answer your questions. She had mentioned um, that she will let me know when she could. All right. You know, at this time, we, we, we have a uh, CD uh, or disc of the identification video from Ms. West's apartment. It was one of, I believe, three videos that the state previously asked us to play during the examination of Detective Smith. We're, we're ready to do that now. Mr. Lockwood, if you could help me. I think it was him. No, before, that man right there. That boy. Can I borrow your book here? For sure. Okay. Right here where it says response. I'm going to fill out this information for you, but it says the subject block that I have checked below is the subject that committed the offense. I am positive of my identification. The second one says the subject block that I have checked below appears to be the subject involved in the offense, but I am absolutely, I am not absolutely positive. And number three says I am unable to identify any of these subjects as being involved for this. Let me look again just okay. to make sure. Mm -hmm. Take your time. You don't Look like him. You just take your time, and then he said it's something about the eyebrows and all that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was him. Okay, I'm pretty sure. Okay. <coughs> okay. And just sign. Um, number one says the subject block that I have checked mm -hmm. below is the subject that committed the offense. I mean, what number is that? Number four. I'm positive of my identification. Okay. Take the punch when you witness this one. Let me do witness or officer. Huh? Witness or officer? <laughs> witness. Hearing. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You get her initial picture? Initial. Initial by number four. Okay. Okay. Ms. West says uh, Detective Smith told me she bring the city of police department. Right. Ma'am, directing your attention uh, back to the moments after the shooting. Do you recall that there were, I think you've already testified to a, a taller white gentleman with a, a beard that uh, came to your assistance? Yes. And then there were uh, several other civilians, several other women there? No, just one woman from the Yellow House. That's the house across the street? Yes. Uh, and then who arrived first at the scene? Police. Okay. Uh, I, I take it a number of cars arrived? Yes. Some in front of Ms. Smith? I'm sorry? Some, in, some arrived before Detective Smith? I'm not sure who arrived first. Okay. But there were a number of police officers on the scene. Yes. Uh, and then the EMTs arrived. Yes. And the first people you spoke to about what happened were the EMTs. No. They were detectives. Okay. Uh, Detective Smith. Yes. And then you talked to the EMTs. I didn't talk to the EMTs about my baby. They would not tell me if he was alive or dead. All right but uh, they overheard your conversations with the police. I'm not sure. Ma'am, is it fair to say that several people have said that you only identified one subject? You know that to be true. Objection, Your Honor, without identifying who several people are, the witness cannot answer the question. I'll rephrase. Do you know of any reason why the EMTs 
w would say that you referred to only one child. Objection, Your Honor, on what supposition the EMTs may have had in their head as to why she may have referred to whatever she said. Same. Initially, you only made reference to one child. I said one young man shot my baby. And that's the person you were talking about initially? I wasn't talking about him. I, I was crying about my baby, wondering if he was alive. And you alternately described that person as a man and a child. I said a, a young man and, and a child. Now, uh, the officers on the scene, they did have police radios? Yes. And they were on their belts or on their lapels? I heard them. So you could hear the radio traffic that was going out? Yes. And uh, somewhere between 925 and 935, you overheard radio traffic about two suspicious looking black men uh, around George Street at Albany. No, I never heard that. Never heard that. All right. Are you sure your recollection of there being two people involved in this case wasn't a response to the radio traffic you were hearing? No. That couldn't be. No, because I was talking to the detectives about my own injury. So you never wavered from beginning to end that there are always two attackers? Yes. Yet you never actually describe anything that the second attacker did to you? He was hiding behind the other young man. What is it? that the other child did to you so that you believe that he was attacking you? He was with the older boy, the young man, and I thought he was going to jump out and kill my baby. You thought the five-year-old was going to jump out and kill your baby? I thought he had a real gun, yes. You thought the five-year-old had a gun, too? Yes. Is it possible that the five-year-old did have a gun? Is it possible there, were more than, there was more than one weapon involved in this case? Your Honor, she's just said that she thought the second child was going to pull out another gun. <laughs> I'm going to object to, to oh. Mr. Economo no. commenting on my examination. I will let you ask if it was possible there it was two guns. Okay. May, may, I'll rule the objection. And is it possible there were two guns out there at the time your son was shot? No, I only saw one. Can you articulate for me, explain to the jury what it is that the second child did that led you to believe that he was part of this attack? He was hiding behind the other boy. And because of that, you have told people that the, the five-year-old should spend the rest of his life in prison? No, I object to the question. You'll say it's not. Ma'am, I'm just trying to figure out why you feel so strongly in the abstract about this second child that you were, say you were never able to see and can I, can't identify exactly what he did. Is that a question, Mr. Yes, Gold? it is. Okay. Can you repeat the question? You feel very strongly about not only the shooter, but about both of these, these individuals. That's a rhetorical question? I'm not sure how to characterize the question. I simply would like you to answer it. I assumed that he was. I actually believed that he was going to hurt my baby also. And that's why you feel so strongly about both? I believe that... Um, that he may have had a real gun if that one wasn't. Well, are we not fairly safe in assuming right now that the gun that the shooter had was a real gun? Yes. Because a moment ago you expressed some doubt as to whether the shooter was using a real gun. In the beginning I thought it was a fake gun, yes. But as we stand here today, you don't have that doubt. Obviously not. Your strong feelings about the other child uh, are because you thought he might have a gun too? Yes. I also thought he was going to strangle my baby or something.
okay. I'm curious why you would be fearful that the five-year-old would strangle your baby after you've already testified to the child being shot at point blank range in the forehead. Did you really have any doubt at that point? I meant before he shot him. Well, what was it about the five-year-old that led you to think that he was about to Because he did not look afraid when he walked towards me. He looked like he was skipping down the street and talking to the big boy. We are aware that the other child, Dominique Lang, is also charged with felony murder in this case. I'm aware of that. What's your understanding of what he did to cause the death of baby Antonio? Jackson, Your Honor, irrelevant to the question of the guilt or innocence of these defendants as to what she thinks dominantly Lang, Dominique Lang did to cause him to be charged. Saying it to the former court, Mr. Goff, you can ask her what Dominique Lang actually did all day long, okay? But well, I, 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 as, as far as I can tell, she, her testimony is he didn't do anything. I'm just trying to figure, ma'am, I'm just trying to figure out if he didn't do anything. Uh, then why did you ask the district attorney to indict him? And why do you feel so strongly about him being punished? Actually, Your Honor, the district attorney doesn't indict anybody. The grand jury indicts <coughs> people. And the decision as to whether to indict is up to the grand jury. And the question is improper, but it's irrelevant. Stain the objection. Ma'am, you are, you've testified that you saw these two young black men run eastward on London Street. Ma'am, <coughs> your testimony earlier was af after the shooting, the two young black men ran east on London Street. Directing your attention to the red push pin at the corner of London and Ellis, can you show the jury, you can borrow my pen if you like, show the jury in which direction you saw the boys run. Was it east or west? I believe it was towards Edmont Avenue. And that would be east. Yes? I believe so. Okay. And if they were running east on London Street, isn't there a, a longshoreman's uh, office on London Street? I'm not sure. You couldn't see people out on London Street down that way? No. Didn't someone else say that they saw people on London Street and they wanted to interview them? Objection, Your Honor, as to who someone else is, if he's got a specific Same. person. Ma'am, is there any possibility that these suspects actually ran westward on London Street? No. Union Street? No, I don't believe so. Well, if they had run westward on London Street, they were... I mean, let's, let's count the distance to this housing project here. That would be uh, from Union Street. That's one, two, three, four, five blocks to the housing project there? It's possible. Okay. Or they're going to run to the east in front of the Longshoremen or Glen Academy and the uh, Housing Authority parking lot and the other housing project with the video cameras on. Yes? Um, I believe so. And of course, just north of where this took place was the post office, was it not? Six blocks north of, of, of where the shooting took place was the post office you went to that morning. It was quite a distance. Not too long to walk on a cold day. I, I didn't think it was that long. It's fair to say that the, uh, the post office doesn't sit by itself, does it? I'm sorry? The post office is not sitting there on Union Street by itself, is it? The post office is on Gloucester Street. Yes. And what's the post office inside? What, what's the question? But what building is the post office inside? Well, the federal courthouse is um, housed in the post office. Along with the U.S. probation office and other federal offices. I suppose. And the FBI office is next to it in the Bank of America building. I suppose it's inside there, yeah. And behind them, going north, you would run into the state probation office, would you not? 
I'm not familiar with that. And you'd run into the state courthouse and the district attorney's office and the Glenn County Detention Center. You'd agree that going north would not be a wise route to escape. They ran down London Street in, in front of the Yellow House. I saw them run. And whichever way they went that way, they were going to be going by police officers and security cameras, you would agree. The police officers weren't there yet. They ran first. Ma'am. <coughs> Directing your attention back to states 53. And I'm going to come back and let you take a good, long look at the aerial photograph of the city of Brunswick. Well, I'm not very good with maps, so your geography don't mean anything to me. Well, I'm not good with maps either, but I'm going to do the I know map. street signs. You know street signs. That's correct. Okay. And they ran towards Albany Street. Even though the shorter and safer path of escape was to the south and the west, that's your record. Obviously, they didn't want to go back to the way they came. Ma'am, is there any reason why you might have deliberately told the police officers that people ran in a direction other than their actual exit. No, I was glad they ran away from us so that they couldn't shoot us again. Let me rephrase. Is there any reason why on that morning you would have wanted to misdirect the police in their investigation? No. Your identification of the other shooter as a, as a five or six year old slash dwarf, is it possible that you deliberately misidentified the other person? No. With respect to the weapon that was involved, did you not initially tell the police that the weapon involved was a Luger? Well, I said it was small like one. The word you used was it was a Luger. No, I said it looked like one. German pistol, World War II era pistol. Recall that. And you're familiar that a Luger is, in fact, a German World War II era pistol. I've seen them on movies. And there's no such thing as a 22 caliber long rifle Luger, is there? I had no idea it was a 22. I knew it was a revolver, that's all. You knew it was a small caliber weapon, right? Yes. Because you thought it was a toy. That's correct. Told the police officers it looked like a Luger. Yes. And that was an accidental mistaken description? I, I don't know the exact description of a German Luger. <laughs> you wouldn't agree, based upon your dealings with all these prosecutors and federal and state and law enforcement people and sheriffs and your visits to the pawn shops and watching things on TV, you wouldn't agree that there are two, there are, it would be hard to find two handguns that look less alike than a German Luger and a 22 caliber revolver. I'm not sure if um, a German Luger has a revolving cartridge. I just said it was small like one. Ma'am, you, have you seen the pictures from the crime scene? And I, I don't miss, wish to be indelicate. I know it brings back horrible memories. But, but have the police not shown you those photos before? It's possible. And were you not, were you, they, they had already started that process of photographing the crime scene while you were still out there. I suppose. Well, do you know of any reason, Is it so, did you say something to the police maybe that led them to take all these pictures and devote all this attention to the front of the house on, at 708 London Street where the baby was when the police arrived? Is there something you did or said to lead them to think that that was the scene of the shooting? No, that's where I performed CPR on my baby. So you never told anyone at the Brunswick Police Department that that was where the shooting took place? Never. Because later in the reenactment, you're, you're walking the police halfway down Ellis Street, aren't you? It was next to the Blue House. 
well down Ellis Street between the 800 and the 900 block. That's correct. But you didn't do anything to lead the police to investigate the crime scene in the wrong place. You had nothing to do with that. They just, on their own, set up and took all these pictures and made all these measurements and all in the wrong place. You had nothing to do with that. I wasn't watching. I was too concerned for my baby. At the time that you were telling them where the shooting took place, you knew there were people on London Street. But you didn't know that Mr. Van Eden was walking behind you on Ellis Street. Did you? I didn't see him until after the boys ran. Ma'am, is it possible that you changed the loca given location of the shooting? No. Ma'am, I'd like to talk some more about the interview at the, at the Glen County Police Department. Um, is it fair to say that you were extremely nervous when the police officers put you in the interrogation room? I was sick before I walked into the police department. Okay. Well, something happened to make you more sick while you were sitting there? Ma'am, is it fair to say that you were terrified at the time that you were being interviewed by the police? You were scared. I was very upset. You were angry. I was really sad. You were angry. I suppose. You were nervous. I was upset. And what's the first thing you ask the police to do when you come in the room, when they come in the room for the interview? Could you repeat that? What's the first thing that you asked the police officers to do when they came in to start their questioning? Did we have to swap out the chairs in the interview room? Yes. I urinated from the IV. You're saying that that had nothing to do with your nerves? No. Is it possible that you were having some kind of um, psychotic episode while you were being interviewed by the police? Is that possible? No. And do you want to describe the statements you made during the interview with the Glen County Police Department on the evening of March 21st? Do you want to describe those statements as bizarre? I'm sorry, ma'am. Do you need a moment? We can give you all the time you need. Can you repeat the question? Would it be fair to say that your behavior and statements during your interview with the police on March 21st were bizarre? My behavior was according to what happened. Possible that you suffered a psychotic episode. Perhaps no, it's not. The shooting. No, That's it's not. not. Possible. Do you not recall the police officers coming back into the room and asking to check your purse in the middle of the interview? Yes, they did. They searched your purse, didn't they? And they also searched my home. They searched your purse in the middle of the interview. Yes? That's correct. And they were looking to see whether you had any weapons. I believe so. You don't think that was a response to what you, what you were saying? No. Do you know a Dr. Al Jabi? I'm familiar with the name. Well, you're not just familiar with the name. He was, for a brief period of time, the pediatrician that was responsible for your <clears throat> child. Briefly. Okay. And you changed doctors. I questioned his ability, yes. Questioned his ability. But during the interview, you questioned something more, did you? I don't recall that. You don't recall suggesting to the police that Dr. Al Jabi, a licensed MD practicing in Brunswick, Georgia, 
had something to do with the death of your child? I never said that. You never suggested that he had something to do with it? I don't recall that. Just like you never suggested that the crackhead or supposed crackhead in the apartment next to you might have had something to do not only with the death of baby Antonio, but also with the death years earlier of your son, Sean Glassy, in New Jersey? I never said that she was responsible for Antonio's death. You would agree that those, that those conclusions were not supported by any objective facts? She was angry at me, no doubt. You do admittedly suffer from paranoia, yes? That's correct. Possible that you were having an episode at this time when you were making these wild suggestions no. about Dr. Al Jabi. No, I don't have episodes. Okay, you have a mental illness, but you don't have any symptoms. I fear people. It's very difficult for me to be sitting here right now. Like a break, please, Miss West. I believe I spoke with you earlier about drugs that you were taking on the day in question for your mental illness. Um, there are other drugs you were taking that day, aren't there? One other one. And that would be Vicodin? Yes. What's your understanding of Vicodin? It's a pain medication. Okay. And you were taking that for uh, an injury? In my left leg. You had taken Vicodin that morning? Yes. And is it possible that the Vicodin or the interaction of the Vicodin that you were taking with these other drugs that were prescribed for you, is it possible that they might explain your behavior on March 21st? It made me drowsy. Well, something made you more than drowsy, didn't it? No. Ma'am, do you not recall speculating to the Glynn County Police Detective, Marissa Tyndall, and to Detective Smith about the person who did this to your child and his family? Do you not recall giving some bizarre statements to the police about the attackers who you had at that point not identified? I don't recall. Uh, at 48.20 into your interview with the Glynn County Police Department, you told the police that he was a little delinquent. Uh, uh, and his mama was a crack whore, that daddy was not there, and that they probably took his food money to spend on crack cocaine. That's what you told the police you thought about the attacker. I did say he was a delinquent. You don't specifically remember telling the police that you figured that the child was starved by his parents because they were spending the money for his food on drugs. No, I don't recall that. And again, at 157.30, you told the police that the attacker, attackers had a whore drug addict mother who didn't buy them food. I didn't hear the first word. Was it poor? Attackers had a whore drug addict mother who didn't buy them food. Poor or whore? Whore. W-H-O-R-E. Oh, I don't know if it was poor or whore. That's, that's the way I heard it in the okay. transcript. I don't recall. Ma'am, you don't find those bizarre statements to make about people you don't know? Well, anybody would want to know why they were doing this. I asked him, why are you doing this? And he never said anything. Ma'am, isn't, isn't it true that <laughs> you were really referring to yourself? No, that's not true. I've worked before my injuries. Ma'am. Did you not starve your daughter, Ashley Glassy? Objection, Your Honor. This is, an, this is irrelevant evidence. Extrinsic acts by a witness are not proper to impeach unless they deal with truthfulness or untruthfulness. And this is improper impeachment of this witness. Your Honor, this jury is entitled to decide. Uh, Your Honor, I, I, this should not be argued before the jury. Well, then, Your Honor. Rise. I'll let you go back up to Record reflects the jury has been removed. All right. Mr. Goff, ask your question again, please. Don't answer. I just want to hear the question, okay? Ma'am, when you describe the attacker of the child twice 
as having starved their child because they were spending the food money on crack. You were describing yourself. Okay. You object. There was an ex another question about her child, Ashley Glassy. No, she, she said no to that. It was the next the question next, to the, which the I next objected. Question. Are you done? The next question <laughs> was that you, in fact, starved your own child, Ashley Glassy. And that's what you objected to. Yes, Your Honor, and I'm objecting to that specifically under 608B. Stall. Your Honor, the issue is not 608B. The issue here is a confrontation uh, issue. The fact is that this woman who lied to the police repeatedly during an interview about abusing her children had, in fact, abused her children, specifically with respect to her son and daughter. She starved her children which ties in in a very chilling and disturbing way to her testimony. Arguably, she was taunting the police as the killer of the children, as the killer of Antonio Santiago, describing the killer as someone else, when in fact she's describing her very self, Your Honor. We've got Ashley Glassy here. We don't need the defects records from the state of New Jersey anymore. We know exactly what happened. She lost custody of her children. She lied to the police about it. She lost custody because <coughs> she starved her oh, child. Hold, hold, hold. There has been no evidence before the court that she has lied to the police about, about these records. Okay. Has her? Uh, no, we haven't asked that Absolutely. question yet. But what we have done, Your Honor, is, is we have gone in to bizarre statements that she made, which suggest that the attacker, that the shooter, was starving their child when, in fact, she's the only person that's been starving anybody in this case. And that would be her own child. Your Honor, you, that, it, can't, it couldn't fit together any more cleanly. Your Honor, it is a severe confrontation clause <coughs> issue. This trial will come back if we cannot get well, into this Well, the Supreme issue. Court may disagree with that, okay? And that's fine. But, I, but I'm going to follow the rules. I got, a, I got Carlson open, I got Millick open, I got Westlaw open. I'm trying to, to find some relevancy and sanity in the fact that you just blurted out in front of this jury that you starved your daughter. And I don't know when, I don't know where, I mean, that, would, that statement just got blurted out. And, and I don't, I'm trying to find where is the relevancy as to, did you be able to just blurt that question out at a witness? Your Honor, the and relevance. How does the fact, assuming that she, she, that she starved her daughter 10, 12 years ago or something, how does that now make it relevant on whether or not she killed her child? Because she. I don't put, put two and two together. I, well, you know, I. With, I, that, with that jump. I mean, right now. You might be able to show it later, but I mean, right now, to be able to say that question, how, how, does, how does the fact that you claim she starved her child well, there's, sometime there's, there's, in the past? Well, Your Honor, there's no, there's no claiming about it, uh, you know. But, Your Honor, this, this, this witness has gave very specific, bizarre descriptions uh, about the attackers who weren't even identified at that point. Uh, which it describes exactly her own behavior, Your Honor. And we're allowed to present that to the jury so the jury can conclude that she well, is. Well, you asked her, and that wasn't herself. objected to. You asked her, are you describing yourself when you made that comment? You asked that, and she said no. Okay? But then you just throw out, you starved your daughter 10 years. Well, you didn't say a time period. You just starved your daughter. Well, Your Honor. I mean, I don't. You know, I, look, if, if, if Mystery Conway wants, you know, we can go back. And, and, and we, we, we can go ahead and present it through impeachment and then get it in that way. But it's going to come in one way or the other. And, Mr. you know, well, I'm I just trying not to be here till midnight, Judge. Well, I want to know from you. Right now, I'm going to sustain that objection up to that question. Now, we might as well go ahead and deal with it, this issue so we don't have the jury going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay? Very well. Okay? Yeah, the court... I've already said that I, you can ask questions about, I mean, you feel like that she lied to the police about whether she had orange socks on or not, then you can ask. Did you tell them you had orange socks on? In fact, you had blue socks, okay? That's certainly, you can ask that question on cross-examination. Now, the real question gets to be, where do you go after that? Because, I mean, then that gets back to, you know, if I find, if it's a, a non-collateral issue, then you can go into it. If I find it's a collateral issue, then the law is that you have to, uh, the cross examiner may confront the witness with the contradiction, but must accept the witness's answer. 
I understand the academic question. The practical reality, Your Honor, is how in a case involving a dead baby where the parents are suspects, how can it possibly be said that abuse of, of prior abuse of other children that they had is irrelevant and not logical to whether or not they abused this child? How is... <laughs> and okay. it's obviously well, impeachment because she lied about it. Okay, well, I mean, its question is whether or not it's, it's, it's whether or not it's collateral to the issue we're trying. The issue we're trying is the guilt or innocence of your client. Okay? So, now, does, does the fact that she, that she lied to the police about this matter, well, you're, I'm not saying she did or didn't, but you're saying she did. Okay? Assuming that you, assuming your, your question. How does that then allow you to go into uh, her relationship with her children or issues she had with her children how many years ago? Well, if the witness, uh, it would be five years ago, seven years ago. No, I take it back. Ms. Ms. Glassie was eight at the time, and she is now 20. It would be 12 years. 12 years ago. Okay. So you're, going, you're asking the court then to be able to go back in and relitigate the, the, the defects issue with her. She lost custody of her children. That's what you're claiming, correct? Yes. Okay. And you want to go back in and relitigate the fact that she lost her children 12 years ago. And that yes. she and that she somehow in her statement to the police either minimized that or lied about it. Correct? Yes. I haven't seen the statement to the police, so I don't know. Which one is it? Is that she minimized it or does she just totally lied about it? What are you claiming? I believe both, Your Honor. At one point she minimized, I believe at another point she lied about it. But I, what, with, all, uh, with all due respect, Your Honor, I, you know, I'm trying to cross-reference a lot of information here. And it is now 6.30 I've, at night, you know. Uh, well, it, we have a jury. The jury has instructed, the, I'll to say this to the record, the jury, has, the jury wants to, they, they, they understand, they're wide awake, they want to keep going. They've asked, they've sent word to the court, they want to keep going. So. So we're going to keep going for a little while, um, but that, that's fine. If Your Honor, you know, if Your Honor will give me five minutes, I, I will find the references in, in the two-hour interview okay. to so, that. Okay. So what you're really trying to do is to impeach her with with these with this defect record. Well, it's a, it's not a defect record. It's a, it's the testimony of her daughter, uh, who we brought down pursuant to court order from New Jersey, Your Honor. Uh, but it is a three-prong. Uh, issue with respect to the admissibility of these things. One issue is whether or not it is impeachment. Uh, another issue is whether or not it is logically relevant to our defense. Your Honor, you asked me a moment ago what the relevance was okay. to, to my client's trial. Uh, I want to know, let's start with that question first. Okay. That very concerns the court. I want to know what you're saying on the record so I can uh, make a determination um, that assuming she either minimized or in your opinion, minimized or lied about her, the defects investigation of her children, okay? How is that then relevant to go, go into that? Right, well, I, I'm going to start back at, at the beginning, Your Honor, as the court mentioned earlier. The qu first question is whether or not it's logically relevant to our defense. You know, our defense is charged for murdering uh, uh, baby Antonio. Uh, Your defense is what? Uh, I, we are charged in the indictment with murdering right. baby Antonio. Our defense is in part is to suggest that someone else did it. Uh, and that is a logical defense and based in evidence already before the court, in addition to some not yet before the court. So that certainly is a, is a, it is certainly a logically relevant if there's evidence tending to suggest that someone else may have killed the child. Uh, and that certainly is relevant. It's so, also, that, here, this begs the question then. That, that any person who's been involved in a custody suit with the state then is a suspect in the death of their child? Or, I mean, or, or, I mean did that... Certainly not in, in, in any case, Your Honor. It's a pretty rare case in my experience, and I, I think Your Honor would agree. It is a pretty rare case uh, where someone is charged with killing a child that they come in and suggest that someone else, specifically the parents, may have been, one or both may have been involved. 
That's Does certainly not, not the usual case. And it's certainly not the usual case that there's actually evidence that, that, that would support those theories. Okay. Assuming that she spanked a child, and I don't know what the evidence would show from, from the, so I have no proof. Assuming that it, the evidence shows that she uh, spanked her child too hard, okay, then what, how does that, what does that prove other than just being pure character evidence? She's a bad, she was a bad mother. The fact that she spanked her child or hit her child with a belt, which would probably be more accurate with respect to Sean Glassy, Your Honor, that would probably be relevant only with respect to impeachment. I don't think, I think we can agree that hitting a child with a belt, it's, it, that's not necessarily logically related. Probably there's a 403 issue with that. However, uh, when the allegation of abuse is involving starvation and the uh, parent... But nobody's alleging that, that Antonio Santiago was starved. No, Your Honor. But the so statement... I'm asking what does it prove? How does it... I guess I, I'm just... I'm having a hard time making the jump and counsel has it... Other than just that she's a bad mother and that doesn't... I mean, doesn't quite get it. No, Your Honor. It's got nothing to do with... I mean, with a bad her. mother or a bad father doesn't deserve to have their child shot. No, Your Honor, it's got nothing to do with Miss West being a, a good mother or a bad mother. And in, in fact, I think medical records show that uh, uh, the child had not been abused uh, prior to death. That's not, that's not the issue here. But the issue is that the mother has made some rather bizarre statements. Now, one explanation for them may have been that she was suffered from a psychotic episode. Another one might have been it was a product of, of use or abuse of drugs or combinations thereof. Another explanation is she's taunting the police department. Another explanation is she's uh, subconsciously or unconsciously projecting her own role in her child's death onto these uh, as yet unidentified attackers, Your Honor. But surely the court could grasp the, the, the logical relevance coincidence in a mother who starved her own children describing the killer as someone who starved their children to buy drugs, which also bears actually is borne out by the evidence in this case. That is an odd and chilling combination. And, and we think that the court, what the court is doing here, with all due respect, and with all due respect to Mr. Economo, is the court is going beyond its role uh, as the... Well, he makes an objection, and then the court's role is, I've got to decide whether or not to sustain or overrule. So, and I, I, I understand And, and that, I can't do that without having, having you state your, your basis uh, for this quite, I mean, this is not the most usual situation that we deal with from day to day. Well, we, I think we can all agree about that. I've never seen testimony like this before, Your Honor. Uh, I mean, it, it's just incredible that, that she comes in and tells the police, you know, that these people, she, we don't even know who they are yet. They haven't been identified. Uh, you know, that they've been starved because their, their, their mother was going out buying crack instead of buying them food. When it turns out, coincidentally, that she had a drug problem and, and, and was buying crack and not feeding her children at the same time uh, when she was in New Jersey. It's, it, it's her life projected uh, onto the shooter and his family in this case. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. But, Your Honor, I think your role is, uh, you're, you, you do have a gatekeeping function, but I think under the rules of evidence, the general rule is if it tends to be probative, logically relevant, uh, that it comes in. And it is highly relevant in this case. It, I have a, a certainly a balancing test. I mean, you know, again, you know, I have to, you, what you're asking the court to do then is to find that this character evidence, that she's a bad mother, somehow then is relevant to show that she committed this murder. Well, Your Honor, if it's a misdemeanor I mean, for impeachment purposes, it, it, it's an academic discussion. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to what I'm, well, I'm gonna tell you what I'm going to do right right now is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you ask her anything, that she, any of these bizarre comments she made to the police, you can cross-examine her on these bizarre comments. You can ask her all day long till midnight tonight or whenever the jury says us we're going, that they're tired of hearing, we can go home. You can ask her every bizarre question she asks. And, um, but I'm not going to let this time, I, I, I do not make the jump that I'm going to allow you to go back 12 years ago as to into defects, into a, a, a matter she had with the custody of her children, defects 12 years ago. All right. Your Honor, what about this statement that was made in the questioning by defense counsel that you starved your child that's still in the jury's mind and the last thing they heard when they walked out tonight? I mean, that, you know, oh, I don't... I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, sustain the objection. They discard the last question of counsel. 
Thank you. That's all right. Ma'am, you also said at 2.05.45 of the interview, I hope you drop dead bitch, you fucking whore murderer. I hope that they catch you and put you the fuck away, bitch. Who were you referring to? I don't recall saying that. Possibly you referring to yourself? No. You remember approximately an hour and 58 minutes into the interview saying he probably practiced in the backyard. Projects probably. Maybe the ones behind Prince Street. I don't understand the question. Do you not recall saying out loud uh, while you were in the interview room uh, that he, that would be the attacker, probably practiced, I presume, shooting in the backyard? Projects, probably. Maybe the ones behind Prince Street. It's possible. You were referring to yourself? No, I was referring to him. Well, I'm curious. A moment ago, when I was showing you what was marked for identification purposes, uh, at stage 53, I guess I'll come back up to you. May I approach you with your honor? May. Ma'am, a few minutes ago, when I asked you, uh, uh, about Hopkins Homes, the housing project with the uh, green, light green, emerald green push pin in it, three blocks, approximately three or four blocks southwest of the shooting, and one less block southwest of your home. You said you weren't familiar with that housing project. That's correct. And yet, the northern border of that housing project is London Street, is it not? You see the, this cluster of buildings here. You'd agree that the, the northern border of that, based on the roof lines, is London Street. I was suspecting that, that he didn't care who he heard it. Thank you, ma'am. But in answer to my question, a moment ago, when I was asking you about the possibility that the suspects involved in this shooting went southwest, to the Hopkins Homes Public Housing Project, you said you weren't familiar with it. I said he went towards Albany Street. They ran. Yes. But when I also followed up and asked you about this public housing project down here, you expressed that you weren't familiar with it. You don't recall that? I remember that. You don't recall saying earlier when I asked you about the post office box at this housing complex that you didn't go there? No, I never did. And yet, ma'am, even though you never go there, you're referring to that housing project which, for which the southern border is Prince Street while you're talking in the interview room. I believe that's where they were coming from. Okay. Now your testimony today is you believe your attackers were coming from Hopkins Homes. Yes. Prior to this evening, you've never said that to anyone. No, that's correct. You didn't tell it to the police after your child was shot and the police were asking for your help to find the people that committed this crime. You didn't mention anything about Hopkins Homes, did you? They mentioned to me that they had cameras over there, so I'm sure that they had the evidence. You didn't mention anything about Hopkins Homes or the possibility that these subjects went southwest to Prince Street, did you? Did you? Excuse me? You didn't mention to the police when the shooting took place and they responded, you didn't say anything about Hopkins Homes or Prince Street. You didn't say anything about people running southwest, did you? I told them they ran down London Street. You told them they ran east down London Street, not west. I never said a directional coordinate. I said they ran down London Street. And were you not here earlier when they played your own reenactment video? Well, maybe I'm wrong. Were you not here? Did not they play that reenactment video with you rolling the cart down the street? Weren't you here for that? That was during your testimony today. Right. 
And in that video, you're saying they ran eastward on London. I said they ran down London. But you were pointing to the east and you were looking to the <coughs> east. They were heading towards Albany Street. Why would you withhold this information now to the very middle of this trial? I'm not familiar with north, east, south, and west. I don't know how to read a compass. I just know street names. Ma'am, do you know Joe Lang? The name sounds familiar. The name sounds familiar because he is a young man involved in this case. And you've heard his name before from the district attorney. I, I received a copy of the indictment. And you saw Mr. Lang hanging out in the witness room with the other witnesses before he testified, didn't you? No, I didn't. Okay. And it would surprise you to learn that Joe Lang lives in Hopkins Homes? Your Honor, I object to the form of the question of surprise. It's irrelevant whether this I'll withdraw and surprise. rephrase. No, I, I, well, let me finish. I sustain as to the form of the question. Ma'am, you know Joe Lang, don't you? No, I don't have many friends. And you knew that Joe Lang lived in Hopkins Homes? No. And you knew that Joe Lang, do you know whether Joe Lang testified that he woke up in Hopkins Homes the morning of this shooting? No. Did you see Joe Lang walking by at the time of the shooting? I did not know his name. And you don't know Dominic Lang either? No, I don't. You just coincidentally picked him out of all those photos that you were shown on the evening of March 21st. That was a coincidence, right? I guess so. Ma'am, were you present when the Langs practiced shooting a firearm? No, I wasn't. You and Mr. Santiago weren't present when they practiced? I can't speak for Mr. Santiago. That wouldn't explain the gunshot residue on both your hands? The police never um, suggested that. Ma'am, the police didn't suggest it because you never told them there was any connection to Hopkins Homes. The first you mentioned Hopkins Homes was today. They never suggested there was GSR on our hands. They never incurred that we were a suspect. You didn't read about the GSR in the media? I don't believe I did. <laughs> Ma'am, do you remember talking about suing the police department? searching your house during this interview? No, I don't recall that. You don't remember talking to yourself in the witness room uh, about suing the police? No, I don't recall that. Well, you'd agree that there was a conversation before the officer stepped out about searching your house? I don't recall that until we arrived at my home. You don't recall expressing concern about the search of your house? No. You don't recall expressing concern about the possibility that it would be damaged? At my home, I asked the police if they were going to throw things all over or tear my furniture. But before you got to the house, when you were still at the Glen County Police Department, you expressed concern about the items in your house. No, I don't recall that. And Angela Smith said, let's stop, we'll go ahead, we'll call the officers right now to make sure they treat your house gently. I don't recall that. And then you're sitting there speculating about how to sue the police department. I never recalled that. These officers never did or said anything to you to suggest in any way that this police department would treat you anything other than courteously and fairly, did they? I, I didn't understand the question. You'd agree that there was no reason to even be thinking about suing the police based on anything they said or did up to that point. I was very distraught. I wasn't thinking about the police. Is it possible you were suffering from some kind of psychotic episode or under the influence of some combination of medications? Objection, Your Honor. Asked and answered several times. She said she was not suffering from a psychotic episode and said it and said it and said it. Thank you.
Ma'am, do you belong to an organized church? Objection, Your Honor, irrelevant. What in the world is her religion or whether she belongs to an organized church have to do with the issues in this case? I don't oh, see the relevance here. I, I can of that. explain. I can put it out right now. We can go to sidebars. Whatever. No, I, I don't want any first. sidebars. I just don't. I don't understand the relevance to the issues in this case as to whether this person belongs to a witness belongs to a church. It's incidental. Both sidebar. But. And do you recall engaging the police officers in a somewhat unusual conversation about life and death? I don't recall. Do you recall telling the police officers that you wanted to live on earth forever? Well, I believed that um, God gave us, um, you know, life to, uh, you know, live everlasting. Okay, so it's part of your religious beliefs that uh, you, you are entitled to life everlasting on earth. Yes. And you were trying to explain to the detectives about baby Antonio and why he's not going to live life on earth. I never said that. Did you tell the police that God didn't want your son to suffer on earth? I never said that. You never said that God didn't want your son to suffer on earth? I don't recall that. Well, you would agree to me, however tragic, and untimely, and premature, that your son's death was, relatively speaking, a merciful one. Objection, Your Honor, on the question of relevancy. What possible relevance to the guilt or innocence of these defendants is it whether this child was killed mercifully? I don't see that as relevant. Your Honor, it's logically relevant to whether the killer may have had a pre-existing relationship with the child as opposed to being a stranger. So it's better if, if you're a stranger, it's not merciful, but if you had a pre-existing relationship, it could be a merciful killer. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, That's the craziest I, thing I've ever heard. I, I don't think I actually said anything like that, Your Honor. I simply asked the question, I believe the question was that you would agree that the child's death, death was merciful, however untimely tragic and premature. You recall you know, similar you know. the questions coming up with the medical examiner in I'll this case. I'll let you ask that question. Her rule. Can you repeat the question? Ma'am, you would agree that your son's death, however tragic and premature and undeserved, was nevertheless merciful? No, I don't believe that. Agree. I was a good mother that the child's death was instantaneous. Objection, Your Honor. How in the world, unless she's a medical doctor, can she know whether it was instantaneous or not? She was there, Your Honor. She watched her child die. Well, we know that. I sustain the objection. Ma'am, was there anything of value in your purse on the day of the shooting? Just my identification. I can't think of any reason why people would be willing to kill to get your purse. Identity theft. But you don't have any bank accounts. Well, I'm, I've heard they can steal social security numbers. What would your social security number be worth? I've heard that people can open accounts with it. It's been done. <clears throat> Ma'am, did you not suggest to the police on several occasions during the interview on March 21st that you did not believe that this shooting was a random act? Yes told the police at approximately an hour and 51 into the interview that 
it may have been premeditated that somebody may have known your route. That's correct. And you said at 157 into the interview, maybe someone saw us shopping at Walmart. I'm sorry? And you said at approximately an hour and 57 minutes into the interview that someone may have seen you shopping at Walmart. I don't recall that. And at 148, did you suggest that someone has a vendetta against the family, your family? No, I don't recall that. Well, you would agree that all those statements would be inconsistent with a random act. I said it was a possibility. And in fact, you told your you had the discussion with your daughter Ashley that someone in the family may have owed a debt to Objection. certain kinds of people. Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. If it has anything to do with what was said to her by a third person. No, no, no. If she said that to me, to her daughter, it's not hearsay at all. It's not how I understood the question. She said you had a discussion. Repeat the question. I'll rephrase the question, ma'am. Did you not talk with your daughter about the possibility that someone in your family owed a debt? And we'll just leave it at that. Owed a debt. I may have said something. That this shooting may have been related to a debt owed. I may have said something to that effect. My baby's daddy made lots of friends in that town. Lots of friends who weren't very nice people. It's possible. Ma'am, did you not tell the police that your ex had drug problems? He had prior to meeting me, he said. He said yes, that he did. Yes. Okay. You also told the police that your, that your son died heroically trying to prevent a drug overdose. I never said that. You never told the police that your son died, died trying to stop a, a woman from being over, overdosed, OD'd by some other man? Oh, you mean my older son. Your older son. I'm sorry. Yes, your older son. Yes, that's correct. And, and you've already indicated that uh, your neighbor was evicted for smoking crack cocaine? Uh, your objection, Your Honor, asked and answered uh, at least six times about the neighbor and the crack. We've heard this. Okay. And ma'am, you have accused Mr. Santiago at times of going across the street to get high with a, with a woman who lives across he the street. Lived Objection, across the street. Your Honor. It is irrelevant that Mr. Santiago, if he did, got high, went to see a prostitute to the guilt or innocence of this defendant. I'll move on, Your Honor. Thank you. Ma'am, did you tell the police that you studied the drug trade in Brunswick? I don't recall saying that. You don't specifically recall using the word studied the drug trade in Brunswick? No, I said there may be a drug problem in Brunswick. Well, we'll get back to that in a minute. But uh, uh, you never used the word study in reference to the drug trade. I studied about drugs. And when the police asked you what you meant by study the drug trade, you then told them that it was part of your studies in school. That's correct. Now, your studies in Washington, D.C., your psychology studies in Washington, D.C., focused on the drug trade in Brunswick, Georgia? It's a sociology course. Um, it, it spoke about people's behaviors. And we all like to think that Brunswick is a famous <coughs> town, but you specifically studied in your Washington, your sociology class in Washington, D.C., the drug trade in the city of Brunswick, Georgia. That's your testimony? Your Honor, I object to what is the relevance to the guilt or innocence of the accused in this case as to whether or not when she was in Washington, she studied about the drug trade in Brunswick. Oh, I don't see the relevance. Your Honor, the witnesses' repeated references to the drug trade in her statements to the police certainly are consistent with the defense theory about her mental state at the time of the interview and at the time of the shootings that day. I don't see how, Ayanna, I still don't see how studying in Washington about the drug trade in Brunswick has anything to do with the shooting and killing of the child. I rule the objection. He has a thorough sit and cross the end. She, he probably thinks that she, he, she said to the police. 
Ma'am, you would agree that your sociology class in Washington, D.C. did not specifically study the drug trade in Brunswick, Georgia. I never said it did. I said it discussed um, behaviors of people in groups. But not those in Brunswick, Georgia. I never said that. So what did you mean when you said you were studying the drug trade in Brunswick? I don't recall saying it. I said I studied about street drugs, but in my other school. And in response to all your references to drugs in the course of your interview, at approximately 48.30 into the interview, the detectives asked you, do you know any drug addicts in town? Is that a question, y'all? I thought it was a question. Did, question. At, at 48, approximately 48.30 into the interview, did the detectives not ask you, after all these drug discussions, do you know any drug addicts in town? Or do you, I'm sorry, do you know any drug addicts? They may have said something to that effect. And you evaded the question. No, I don't know many people. Really? That's your answer today? Yes. Well, in March, your answer was the town is full of them and you try and stay away from them. <sighs> My neighbor was on drugs. We found drug paraphernalia out in the yard, and their house was searched by police and K-9 unit. And you added that uh, the drug people were getting too close to you? I was worried that they lived next door, yes. And then Detective uh, Tyndall, trying to get you to open up about your knowledge of drugs, asked you or told you, or started to tell you rather, that they're not all bad people. I don't recall that. And then you cut her off because you disagreed with her. I just remember telling her that I studied about substance abuse in Ashworth College in Georgia. And then at another point in the interview, you said, I'm not going to give in to the drug trade in this S-H-I-T city. I don't recall that. Well, it, okay, so because you can't recall it, uh, you can't tell us what you were thinking when you said it. I don't recall saying it. Ma'am, you were evasive when she asked you if you knew any drug addicts, weren't you? Well, I can't be specific who they are. Ma'am, you are, in fact, a drug addict. No, I'm not. I've never done drugs. You've never done drugs? No. You've never done crack? No, I, I drink sometimes. You drink a lot of Bacardi? Um, there was a time when you drank a lot of a party, wasn't there? Um, years ago, I may have drank past my limit once or twice. Why would an eight-year-old know how to spell Bacardi? Excuse me? Why would an eight-year-old know how to spell Bacardi? Objection, Your Honor. What Referring eight year to an eight-year-old. I don't understand the question. I'll move on. Question. An eight-year- what eight-year-old to spell Bacardi? Ma'am. Were you on cocaine on the day that your child died? No. And I never starved my children either. And my husband bought a lot of the groceries. Ma'am, do you know a Roderick Johnson? That, that name don't sound familiar. Did you engage in sexual relations with him? Objection, Your Honor. That is outrageously asked. It is irrelevant as to whether for the truthfulness or lack of truthfulness of this witness to inquire into something like that. That clearly puts her character in evidence on a matter that is collateral and cannot possibly have anything to do with the guilt or innocence of those two defendants. 
Your Honor, given, Ms. of course, aside from the fact that she's opened the door at this point pretty clearly into her drug use, it's certainly relevant, Your Honor. She is repeatedly referencing in this interview uh, crack horse, many of whom she's speculating have some relationship to the shooters in this case, when in fact she is describing herself, Your Honor. And we, as the court is well aware from the motions on file, we have a witness who's made a statement to that effect. This is not a fishing expedition, and Mr. Economo is well aware of that evidence. Now, there is no, I, who said that she's a drug addict? Because she takes prescription medications? That makes her a drug addict? She, he asked her about cocaine, she said no. Now he wants to talk about her sexual history. All that is is putting her character into evidence. Ask something that has to deal with whether she knows how to tell the truth or whether she's a liar. Ask whether she's got motives to be biased in favor of the government. Your but Honor. don't ask questions about what her sexual proclivities are. That has nothing to do with the guilt or innocence of Elkins and his mother. Your Honor, she said that she never used drugs and she's also spontaneously, voluntarily, and with, <coughs> with that question said she never starved her children. Those doors are all open. Oh, I think as to uh, any kind of sexual history, I want to sustain the objection. Did you do crack cocaine with a Roderick Johnson? No. Have you ever made a crack pipe? No. <laughs> Did you not possess crack pipes in the state of New Jersey? No. Did your son and daughter not find crack pipes in your house? Never. Did they not specifically find crack pipes with steel wool used to make the filter? No. Do you know why you would have shredded steel wool in your apartment? Because we had rats. <clears throat> well, you, you, know, uh, you know that there's more than one use for steel wool. Am I correct? No, I'm not familiar with that. You're not familiar. other than clean oven. You're not familiar with the use of shredded steel wool to make crack pipes? I'm not familiar with that, no. Well why did you possess shredded steel wool? I explained that um, we had rats and um, there were spaces to put the steel wool in so that they wouldn't get in. It was very damp under the house and the landlord couldn't get rid of them. You don't deny that you had shredded steel wool. You say that it was to protect yourself against rats. That's correct. You know it has another purpose. No, I didn't know that. And it's just a coincidence that the crack pipes found by your children in your house were made with steel wool. Objection, Your Honor. There is no evidence that her children found crack pipes in her house. And she said no, that she used the steel wool to keep rats out. Any objection? Ma'am, did you not admit to your daughter, Ashley Glassy, that you were using crack cocaine as recently as January of this year? Your Honor, no. I have never asked for a sidebar because I don't like to do that unless the court orders it. But I would like the jury to be excused right now because I would like to approach the bench and speak with the court. All right. Your Honor, I would like to note that the cross-examination of this witness began at 3.02 this afternoon. We have taken breaks. I realize that, maybe three. But it is now 10 minutes after 7. So she has been subject to cross-examination off and on for about four hours. I'd like to call the attention of the court to two rules. One is Rule 611 and the other is Rule 623 of the Rules of Evidence. The court shall exercise, this is 611, the court shall exercise reasonable control over the mode and order of interrogating witnesses and presenting evidence so as to, one, make the interrogation and presentation effective for the ascertainment of truth, two, avoid needless consumption of time, and three, protect witnesses from harassment or undue embarrassment then goes on to talks about a court witness may be cross-examined on any matter relevant to the proceeding. I also call the court's attention in conjunction with 611 to rule 623 which says it shall be, that's on page uh, 173 of Carlson, it shall be the right, the right, not 
option but the right of a witness to be examined only as to relevant matters and to be protected from improper questions and from harsh or insulting demeanor. I think that in his zeal, which I understand in Georgia that the witness that a defendant and the state for that matter has a right to a thorough and sifting cross-examination. But we have sifted this witness and we have been thorough with this witness or defense counsel has for something in the neighborhood of four hours. And while I recognize her importance in this case, the court has the authority under these two rules to protect this witness because she's got a right from a harsh or insulting demeanor and improper questions. We have also, and, and from undue embarrassment. We have, Mr. Goff has interrogated this witness time and again over drugs, trying to get into sex, trying to get into the abuse of her children from a prior union, uh, having st allegedly starved those children, now that she's smoking crack pipes and keeps uh, steel wool in her house to make pipes, and on and on and on. I submit to the court that it's time to end it. It's time to draw this to a conclusion. Notwithstanding the right to a thorough and sifting cross-examination, we've achieved that in this case. And now it's gotten to the point where we are now inventing questions to embarrass Miss West, the defense is, I should say. That's what's happening in this case. And I ask the court to exercise its right to control these proceedings under Rules 611 and 623 and stop it. If Mr. Conwell's done, Your Honor, I, I I'm done. Your Honor, I can well understand the state's concerns here, but let's, let's, be, let's be clear on the record. We have been suggesting from day one that the state refused to investigate the backgrounds of their key witnesses. Uh, and I am sorry that it turns out that their witnesses were not who they thought they were. But that was the state's election. We have begged them, B-E-G-G-E-D, begged them to do background investigations on their key witnesses. I, I don't know what more I could have done other than get on the ground and, and, and bark with my tongue out, ju Judge. Uh, I am sorry. Uh, that we had to do it for them. I am sorry about the results. No one would wish anyone to go through this kind of lifestyle. However, we are where we are, Your Honor. The witness voluntarily, spontaneously, not in response to any question we actually asked, said, I never starved my children. Under Georgia law, old evidence and new, that opens the door. So we don't even have to worry anymore about whether it's impeachment or how it ties into the other bizarre things the witness has said. That door's open. The witness also volunteered that she has never used drugs, Your Honor, which would be consistent with the same statement she made two weeks ago at the last hearing. It's not like there's anything new in her statement, but the state has always known that those statements were untrue. As far as whether or not my client can receive a fair trial constitutionally under the Confrontation Clause, Sixth Amendment, and, and the, the, the state provision, Your Honor, I don't see how it could be any more relevant that someone who has uh, lost a child to a shooting under bizarre circumstances and engages in bizarre statements on the day of the shooting that go on for some two hours uh, certainly raises the question as to what the witness was under the influence of. And since the identifications are being made in the same time frame, it is impossible to sever out the witness's ongoing substance abuse issues uh, from her identification of my client. And it's also impossible to sever that out from motive, bias, and credibility. It's also impossible to sever that out from whether or not she had a role, whatever it might have been, in this death of her own son rather than my client. Your Honor, I, if this evidence isn't relevant in this case, then it, I, I just couldn't see how it could be relevant in any case. And while I well understand that it lengthens the trial, and we share the court's concern and the state's concern about that, and, and we take no relish in, in going through these things, Your Honor, but they are highly relevant. It would be ineffective <laughs> for us not to address those, and if this court even if this court wanted to address it at this point, I think under the rules of evidence, the, the court's discretion is somewhat limited. But there's no question at this point, if we're not allowed to go into those two issues, this case will come back. Now, the court, as the court has said before, that's the Supreme Court's job. But at the same time, 
uh, Your Honor, uh, as uh, conduct the, the judicial officer conducting this trial. The doors are opened. The evidence is clearly admissible. Even before getting, as you'll remember, we still haven't gotten our recess to go find the, the, the specific impeachment questions. Uh, but it's coming in, whether it's coming in under an impeachment or for all the other reasons we've already discussed, it's clearly highly irrelevant and at the very center of this case. So notwithstanding all Mr. Economo's protestations, we're ready to proceed.